Hi guys, welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. And today guys, today I am going to outline for you my top 10 fantasy protagonists of all time as of 2021. And I'm gonna make this kind of a yearly thing, maybe every summer that I will update the list and kind of see where it stands. But this is gonna be of all time, of all the books that I've read, these are my top 10 favorite fantasy protagonists. Now, please understand, in order to get this list to top 10, I had to one, shunt some to honorable mention, two, leave some off entirely. And if, guys, if your favorites are on this list, that's okay. It's my favorite list, not yours. I'm not telling you, you got to remove them from your list. My list must needs not be yours. And I excluded villains. Like I excluded antagonists because some of my favorite fantasy characters are, are antagonists or villains. So I'm going to have a separate video with them because there were just too many. Like I just couldn't, it was, it was never going to keep it down. So, you know, these are only going to be protagonists. So without wasting any more time, let's get down to business. Let's talk about my top 10 favorite fantasy protagonists of all time, 2021 edition. So in the honorable mention, I'm just going to knock out, I got five honorable mentions here. And these guys didn't make the list for one reason or another. Uh, three of them didn't make the list because not, they're not really fantasy protagonists. And that is Richard Sharp from Bernard Cornwell's The Sharp Books. Richard Sharp is just scrappy and does what needs to be done and is just the quintessential soldier. Uh, who, you know, has an idea about what is right and wrong and watching him climb up the ranks and kind of befriend Sir Arthur Wellesley as much as you can befriend Sir Arthur Wellesley. And his books have one of the most horrible villains of all time, Obadiah Hakeswill, which I also won't be able to put on my fantasy antagonist list because, again, not fantasy, but guaranteed Hakeswill is in the honorable mentions. So I love Sharp but couldn't include him on this list. Uh, on that same, on, by that same token, Dirk Struen from James Clavell's Taipan. I remember, I've only read Taipan once, but I remember loving Struen in this. He is just so resourceful and so brilliant. And he runs one of the trading houses against his uh, arch nemesis and, you know, former friend, Tyler Brock. And the back and forth and what these guys are willing to do to destroy each other was just brilliant. And I didn't, I, like, I didn't think I was going to end up liking him, but I love Dirk Struen. Such, such a, like, a, one of those awesome, like, do whatever it takes to survive and succeed protagonists. Next in the honorable mention, I have Kavax Ow Telemannus. Man, guys, if you've read the Red, Red Rising series, the Telemannuses are just the best. And Kavax is the best of them. He's just big dude, you know, has a little pet fox and is always like, oh, Telemannus, oh! And he's just always bellowing and always happy and always in a good mood. And I, I love Kavax, but not enough to make this list. He just, I mean, he's there and he's one of the most pleasant characters in the Red Rising series, but I mean, he doesn't do enough to really warrant a spot on my favorite. We've also got a new a new one from a book I just read, The Folding Knife, and this is Basso the Magnificent, uh, for the, the protagonist from The Folding Knife. This is one of the most brilliant fantasy characters I have ever read. One of the smartest, especially economically and politically, uh, characters in any book that I've ever read. And he was just a freaking genius. And just watching him uh, manipulate the economy and manipulate the politics was, it, it was just amazing to watch. But he's kind of a douchebag and he's a little unpleasant. So I didn't, you know, he doesn't make this list. So close though, so close. And finally is one that would have been on my list last year before I read all these amazing books with these amazing characters. And that is Croker, the analyst of the Black Company. Guys, Croker's arc, I really love. I love seeing how Croker changes from Black Company uh, through the books. I remember Croker really distinctly from all the times I've read Black Company. And I, I recently reread it. I don't like Croker quite as much as I used to when I was, you know, a brooding teenager. Uh, but I do like Croker and he is very close um, and in the honorable mention spot. So with those honorable mentions out of the way, it's time to start counting down with number 10. So at the number 10 spot I have, and you know, this might change when I finish rereading the books, but I'm starting my reread this month. So this is all on nostalgia and memory. This is also why it's in the number 10 slot. And this is Haplo, the protagonist from the Death Gate cycle. And Haplo is on here because I think about Haplo uh, as a character 
more often than really any other book that I read back when I was younger, when in, in my, my high school, early college, early college years. And I've read The Death Gate Cycle a couple times, but I always keep coming back to Haplow because I think his arc as a character is really, really good. He begins in book one, this just complete like blind servant to the Lord of the Nexus, and he has a dog companion, which is awesome. The dog doesn't talk. It's just a freaking dog that travels with him. And, you know, Wise and Hickman kind of use the dog to show that he's human and actually does have empathy and cares about people. He's um he's a member of the the patron race that was locked in the labyrinth by the Sartan, and so he saw his mom like killed in front of him when he was a baby or when he was a little kid, and the Lord of the Nexus helped him out, and he's now on this mission to kind of like prepare the worlds for the Lord of the Nexus's coming. And so Haplo begins as just this really angry, bitter zealot. And to watch his character growth, I'm not going to spoil in which direction the uh, his character arc takes, but to watch his character change from that very beginning book, from the beginning of Dragonwing, all the way through uh, all seven books is really, really good. I love his character progression. I love his arc. I love that he becomes this more three-dimensional character rather than just this teenager consumed with rage. It's just, it's so, so good. And I remember how much I love Haplo because he's kind of really the first real anti-hero that I, that I read about uh, because Haplo is not nice and he's not... I mean, he's really kind of prickly and mean, but you understand why he and his people are ticked off. They were locked in this labyrinth that was literally for population control to just kill all of them uh, because they rose too far because the freaking god Sartan thought they were too powerful. Ugh, I love Haplo. And if you've read Deathgate Cycle, hopefully you agree with me on our boy Haplo in there. Now, as I continue, how many... There's no way anyone got Haplo because I never talk about him here. But how many of the rest of these can you guess before I finish this video? So at the number nine slot, is a, this is a new character whom I love, who has cracked this list, and that is Emily Marshwick from Adrian Tchaikovsky's Guns of the Dawn. Guys, Emily is one of my favorite protagonists, obviously because she's on this list, but also one of my favorite, she's one of my favorite female protagonist. Emily is like, kind of like Mary from Downton Abbey and Elizabeth from Pride and Prejudice and also Richard Sharp from the Bernard Cornwell books. She is a noble woman who are, they are down on their luck during these war times where they're worried that they're gonna lose, they're gonna lose their house, which, you know, is, is this big estate. Um, and, you know, the times are lean because everyone's off at war and everything costs a ton. And, and you know, their dad had lost a lot of their uh, a, a lot of their money before he passed. And she ends up being drafted into Lascan's military and she becomes a soldier. And she is strong from the beginning. Her back and forth, like, hostile relationship with the mayor of their town, Mr. Northway, is... It's just such good character writing. Her determination and grit and, you know, she doesn't complain at all. When they draft the women, all the other noble houses send one of their female servants to the army. Emily, she can't stand for that. She can't live with herself sending one of the servants. So instead, she volunteers for the draft, fight for her brother-in-law who's already there, her younger brother who's already there, and so that her sisters do not have to. And she is tough. She is brilliant. She is witty. She's clever. Emily is such a good character. Such a good character. I love Emily Marshwick and the choices that she makes are not always the ones that you want her to or that you expect her to make, but she is such a compelling character to follow in this book. Also, guys, it needs to be said that Adrian Tchaikovsky says more people need to read this book because he has the idea for a sequel. Y'all go out and read Guns of the Dawn so that he'll write this sequel because I would love to read another book following Emily Marshwick. So she takes the number nine slot. At number eight, we have Ota Machi, the protagonist of, one of the protagonists of the Long Price Quartet. Ota is watching Ota's life. You get like 40 something years of his life from Shadow and Summer all the way to Price of Spring. And Ota is, he wants to be a good man and he makes decisions that are hard. 
and he is troubled by his past and all sorts of other things that I can't really talk about, but he is just such a compelling character. Abraham has written such real characters in the Long Price Quartet. Ota feels real at every at every turn, from when he's a, a kid, like a prepubescent teen at the very beginning of Shadow and Summer, to where he is in his late 60s in Price and Spring. Every decision he makes, when he's, a, when he's young, he makes dumb decisions. When he's old, he makes bad decisions, but decisions that are necessary. They're just not what you want him to make, and they cause, you know, pain and stuff like that. And he is real from the beginning. He is brilliant. Ota is just so brilliant. He's so good. Like anyone who's read Long Purse Quartet will absolutely agree that Ota is one of these protagonists that absolutely sticks in your mind. If you're not reading Long Purse Quartet, please read Long Purse Quartet. What's wrong with you guys? Like, it's a masterpiece. Please read it. At the number seven slot, Karsa Orlong from the Malison Book of the Falling. Guys, Karsa had to be on here. There are so many Malison characters that I like, but I didn't have room for a bunch of them. So I had to pick one. And I ended up picking Karsa, even though I probably, it's possible that just individually I like Bug better, um, or T Hall, or um, maybe tr Troll, um, or Fiddler. But Karsa is on this list because Karsa does the impossible. So if y'all have watched, if you watch my, my videos at all or talk to me in Voxer or any, listen to me on a live show where I'm just, I have no, uh, I have no ed editing control. Uh, I don't like, I don't like unpleasant characters. Like I just don't. Like I don't like douchebags. I don't like characters that are unpleasant and mean all the freaking time. But Karsa Orlong has done the impossible from when he is introduced in House of Chains, and so, you know, minor spoilers for Karsa's character arc, minor. How he grows as a character from just the bestial barbarian in freaking House of Chains through what he becomes. Like, he doesn't stand for anything. He has no principles. It's not like Karsa's a good guy. He's freaking not. But the fact that I root for Karsa and find Karsa hilarious when he, he always says witness and tells the witch to stop talking. And you know, you, you tell Karsa not to do something, he's like, I will kill that. You're like, no one can kill that, Karsa. He's like, I will kill that. Karsa, are you kidding? Like, it's Godzilla. I, it will be Deadzilla when I am done, witness. And it's just like, Karsa, like, you can't do everything, except that he can. Like, Karsa, ah, with his freaking flint sword or whatever. Like, I love Karsa. He, uh, if you've read freaking Malazan books, I mean, maybe there are people who don't like Karsa, but Karsa is just abhorrent with some of the things that he does. And I still root for him. And that is a good character right there, which is why my boy Karsa takes the number seven slot. At the number six slot, I revisit the Long Price Quartet because here I have Mati. Now, <laughs> there are people from who read Shadow and Sun, or who've read Long Press Quartet, who are like, Mati, really? Okay, so, I do not like Mati better than Ota, as, as a person, as a character. However, Mati has stuck with me. I have been thinking about this character since I finished the Long Press Quartet in March. And so it is, it's been, you know, almost four months, and I'm still thinking about this character. I talked about Ota's arc, Mati, again, like that's what the Long Price Quartet is about. Like the lives of these two men um, and others, but, but at, at the center, these two men over the course of 40 something years of their lives. Mati's arc is so real and so, it's just emotional and it's just so good that I cannot stop thinking about this character and this character's arc. He is not, I mean, he is not like, He's, I mean, Ota's, you know, a few years older and Ota's smarter and all these other things. Like, Ota's just, he's just different. Mata, Mati is just different. Ota's not, Ota's not a poet, Mati is. And it's just, it's just so good. It's so good. So while most people probably don't like Mati, and you know what, it, it, I understand that. I understand that. There's a lot to, there's a lot to dislike about Mati. But as a character, I, I, I'll be thinking about, I'll be thinking about Mata and Ota for years, years to come. That is why he's the number six slot. 
at the number five slot. We're at the top five here. It is my boy, Kelsier. Yes, Kelsier, who is a hero. Kelsier is a hero, and don't tell me otherwise. So Kelsier from uh, the Mistborn series, I love Kelsier. Kelsier is, this is the first revolutionary we have on this list. He organizes a team to try to overthrow the evil empire. Do you hear the people say, Run by the Lord Ruler, and he is just so laser focused on this goal. And I love Heist, and I love Heist leaders. I, I like that he's not like, you know, mopey all the time, even though he has a backstory. He's just like, oh, oh man, like, you don't understand my pain. I love that he smiles all the time and that he is wanting to get the job done. Everyone just needs to always stick to the plan. Listen to Kelsier, and you will be. A-OK, -okay, because Kelsier knows what is what. I love Kelsier. I love his character. I love that he's trying to overthrow the evil empire. Do you hear the people say, and I like how he uh, teaches and treats Vin. He is uh, sort of a kind of like surrogate father figure, kind of like Fagin from Oliver, but I mean, yeah, he's kind of like that, but no, he's, I mean, he's kind of like that, like to where, you know, he, he has compassion for her, but also is going to use her however he needs to as a tool because Kelsier has one goal and that is to overthrow the evil empire. Do you hear the people say, Guys, I love, I love characters that stand for something. I love characters that are laser focused in stopping evil. Love it, love it, love it, love it. And that is why Kelsier is at number five. For, as, for those of you who know how much I love Kelsier, that must tell you something about my top four here. The fact that Kelsier is at number five. Holy crap, right? At the number four slot as we near the top of the list. My number four spot is probably my favorite, I mean, my favorite female character in fantasy right now, and that is Edith from the Books of Babel, Edith Winters. So, minor spoilers for, um, minor spoilers for Sinlin Ascends, um, really minor spoilers for the end of, of Sinlin Ascends. Edith is such a well-written character. From her backstory about how she ended up in the tower, uh, to the things that she has to do to survive and help Tom. She's just, she's just so well written. She has real struggles. She has real emotion. She's incredibly strong. She has to hold it together as, you know, as part of the, the airship crew. She has to hold things together as Mr. Winters when everything else is falling apart because there's, you know, Tom who's kind of naive and then Valletta who's, who's young and Adam who's a doofus and Iren, who is struggling with her newfound freedom. Edith is just, she is just the rock, while at the same time being so incredibly loyal to Tom. Just look at where she is by the end of Senlin Ascends. And then you have Tom, who is just like resisting everything, like trying his best to resist the influence of the tower. And the two of them, as, as protagonists, are just fantastic. I love, love Edith. She is so close to number three, so close to number three. And it is possible with book four that she could ascend to that third level. I love Edith, guys. Like if you've read these books, Edith is such a well-drawn character. Really, they all are. But Edith especially appeals to me because of just, you know, her kind of like, because of the principle she stands for and, you know, being, you know, in charge of things and all that stuff. I love Love Edith Winters, such a, such a brilliant character. And so now we enter the top three, barely, barely surpassing Edith Winters is Thomas Senlin from the same books. Tom is like right here and Edith is like right there. And if it wasn't, if Tom wasn't a teacher, probably would not, probably would not pass uh, Edith because Edith is just so freaking cool. But Tom, the, the reluctant headmaster who loses his wife at the beginning of the first book, Watching, Tom, I love characters that uh, stick to their principles. I love characters that uh, stand for something. And Tom, as I've said in all of my reviews of these books, Tom refuses 
to bend. He refuses to let the tower break him. He, ha he has to make some compromises, but it's not, it's less him compromising his principles and more not being a fool. Because when he is a fool, the tower goes after him. But he meets all of these people who have been corrupted and just like beaten down and they've given up because of how corrupt and evil the tower is. But Tom refuses, he refuses to, to devolve into that despair. Instead, choosing to believe in the people around him, believe that they are better than what the tower says they are. And I love people like that who lift other people around them up rather than putting them down, which is why I don't really love unpleasant characters who tend to do that and be like, Ugh, screw you. Like who, like who likes to hang around with people like that? If you're like that, people probably don't like hanging around you all that much. And so I love Tom. I love, uh, I love that he's intelligent. He has a high intelligence score while lacking a high wisdom score. Uh, I love that he is a teacher. I love how much he loves his wife. And he is, you know, on this probably foolhardy quest to find her. Thomas Senlin is the first character since I've been on booktube that I immediately connected with and knew was going to be a favorite of mine. It is a shock that he is at the number three slot and not higher. But there Thomas Senlin lies. In the number two slot, we have the outraged idealist, Falcio Valmond of the Great Coat series. There is no way that Falcio could not be here at this number two slot. Falcio is a fool at a lot of times. Falcio is driven by his oath to the, to the dead king. He is a Great Coat who believes in justice and believes in bringing that justice to Tristia. He is very clever and very intelligent, but he is all, but he is often ruled by his emotions. And when he is emotional, he does foolish things because he is so burning with this zealotry to bring justice to Tristia, to honor the memory of his dead friend, King Palus. But I love all the great coats. I love uh, Brasti and Cast also, but Falcio, I identify so much with Falcio. I uh, understand Falcio. I love Falcio so much. I love, uh, I love watching him grow as a person. I love ha watching him struggle with, you know, his idealism, with his beliefs. He's a terrible politician because he doesn't. He doesn't want to make the kind of compromises that are necessary when, you, when you're when you in, you know, a snake pit, uh, which is, you know, all politics. He just believes that everyone should just do the right thing. And if not, you duel them and you kill them and then you get someone who's gonna do the right thing. And he, you know, it's just like, I guess I'll just kill everybody who doesn't listen. I love Falcio, he is such a good character. And it is so interesting to watch when people read these books, who their favorite character is. Sarah over at Sarah Reads just finish the series and she like me likes Falcio the best and she and I both like Tyrant's Throne as, as our favorite book but people who like Brasty tend to like Night Shadow the best because it's the Brasty book and then people who like Kest the best tend to like uh, Saint's Blood because that's the Kest book. It's just really interesting to see which book is your favorite based on which of the great coats is your favorite. I love Falcio. I am with him the entire way. My heart breaks for him when he sees that life is not what he wants it to be because this is how I feel all the time. Life is not what it should be. Uh, and life is not what it could be. And you know, people are like, life's not fair. Ugh. Yeah, you know why? You know why life's not fair? Because most of you make unfair decisions. That's why. Because most of you choose to be unfair. A tornado comes out of the sky, hits your house, kills your dog. That's unfair. That is. That's unfair. And you know, no one could do anything about that. That sucks. But when it is unfair because someone else chooses to be unfair, to be selfish or a douchebag or screw you over for their own personal gain, that is not life being unfair. That's people choosing to be douchebags. That's not the same thing. Life does not have to be that way. People choose to make it that way. There is a huge difference. And this is why I identify with Falcio and I, you know, completely am behind him in his quest. Ah, <sighs> poor Falcio. So, guys, do you know who's gonna be on the number one spot? Do you, have you predicted it already? Because uh, here we go. My favorite fantasy character 
my favorite fantasy protagonist of all time, as of 2021. In the number one slot, we have Resand, who is the High Lord of the Night Court from a Court of Thorns and Roses series. Now, I have only, I know, you're all surprised. I have only read Akatar. I have not actually read the rest of the series. But Resand in this book is so, he is so much what I love in a character. Like, I like from the beginning, like he's supposed to be mysterious, like this, this kind of mysterious, uh, re I mean, he's like, you know, one of the really super good looking guys, but he's like, he's a bad guy, but you kind of know that he's, you know, playing both sides. And, and even from the first time he encounters Feyre, he's just kind of like, oh, he's doing that like really like aloof kind of interaction that I really like with my mysterious protagonist. There's one point in, uh, later in the book where she is doing something or another, but behind her, she hears Resan from the doorway. And I knew before, before Sarah J Mass got to the description, I knew he was leaning against the doorway. And guys, I really love it when characters do that, lean against doorways in order to act cool. And so that really solidified that and the fact that, uh, you know, he went inside Feyre's mind and, you know, used her as kind of like, uh, a prop in the dancing, in the dancing party. Like, th all of that, the fact that he was, and I'm sure one of the main reasons that I know he, that he's my favorite and is going to be my favorite going forward is I know that he's got some kind of like tragic backstory. So I can learn why he is the way he is and, you know, really uh, I identify with him and want to like be there for him because of how tragic his backstory is. And so that, I think, really solidifies him as... Guys. No. No. I hope, I, like, I, it is my fondest hope that no one watching this was like, oh my gosh, he loves Resand because guys, like, if you're, if you're new to my channel and like you literally just thought that we had a connection, we did not. Resand sucks. He's the worst. Resand is not at the number one. I'm just, Joshin, y'all. As you probably predicted, number one, my favorite fantasy uh, protagonist of all time is none other than Commander Samuel Vimes of the City Watch from the City Watch books subseries of the Discworld books by Terry Pratchett. Sam Vimes, I love Sam Vimes. Sam Vimes is Richard Sharp, <laughs> but in, in fantasy. Uh, and, you know, he's smarter. He's smarter than Sharp. He is very, very clever, and he is like Falkia, where he believes in fairness. What I really love about Vimes is that Vimes takes what he does very seriously. There are, he hates politicians, and he doesn't like soldiers, because soldiers obey commands without question. And oftentimes, the people commanding them are morons. And Sam Vimes does not believe in obeying moronic commands, which is why he expects his, his watchmen to disobey him if he gives a stupid command. But... He doesn't really trust a ton of people to give better commands. Vimes does not believe that anybody's above the law. He says in one book, there have to be policemen, even for kings, because if everyone is not subject to the law, then it's not fair. Then, like, why should anyone be subject to the law if everyone isn't? And guys, we know what kind of world we live in. The law is not the same <laughs> for everyone. It's just freaking not. Do you think that someone who has a million dollars is subject to the same law that I, a public school teacher, am? The answer is no. I mean, even just from the, even just from the attorney that you can hire with the amount of money you have. And because of that, because our society is not perfect, because human beings are douchebags by and large, because of this, like you, we can pretend that it's, it's, it's whatever it needs to be. You can be like, no, it's totally fair. No, it's not. And if you're saying that, you are definitely one of the people to whom the law does not apply. Samuel Vimes is a class hero. He does not tolerate uh, you thinking you're better than he is or better than anybody is because you have more money. You occupy a different strata of society. Everyone is subject. If you're a criminal, he's bringing you down. Doesn't care, doesn't care if, you're, if you're the freaking patrician. He'll bring you down if you're a criminal. One of my favorite scenes of all time with Samuel Vimes is when, and I've said this before if you've seen any of my Discworld videos, Captain Carrot catches, a, uh, catches someone who's a part of the, he's not the main bad guy, but part of the, the criminal conspiracy. 
whose work ended up killing a mother and child in the poor part of Ankh Morpork. And he's like, yeah, so I'm arresting you for this. And, you know, Carrot kind of feels bad for the guy because, you know, he's just being used because he's dumb. He's just being used by the real bad guy. And Carrot's like, yeah, I'm bringing you in. Uh, your work, like what you've done, killed, killed a mother and her child. And the guy goes, were they important? And Carrot says, oh... Now see, I was feeling bad for you up to that moment. And you're also, it is your lucky day. And he's like, how's my lucky day? It is your lucky day that I found you before Vimes did. Because if, if Samuel Vimes heard someone say that, that guy's done. Like that guy is cooked. He's gonna get tossed off the Tower of Art. Because Vimes hates that line of thinking. Were they important? Get out of here. And so I love that Vimes, even as he climbs the, the, the social ladder himself with Lady Sybil, Vimes is, you cannot pull him off the street. You cannot pull him out of what he is, which is a copper. And the copper chases and he writes wrongs in the city. And I love, I love, I love Commander Vimes. Vimes really has always been my favorite fantasy character since I was in high school and first read Guards Guards. And every time I reread a Guards book, I rediscover how much I love Sam Vimes. This is probably no surprise to, you know, some people. Some of you, you probably guessed that it was Vimes. Guys, I love, 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 love Sam Vimes. Hands down, my favorite. I'm not sure next year it's going to change. It would be a, it would be an Her a Herculean feat to topple Sam Vimes from the number one slot. So who knows how long, how long old Vimes is going to stay there. So guys... That is it for me for today. Uh, I will eventually come with uh, some companion videos, uh, top 10 antagonists, and then top worst characters of all time. That list I already have filled out. Guys, who are your favorite fantasy characters of all time as of 2021? Let me know down in the comments. You don't have to tell me all 10, but just tell me some of your favorite characters. I know Albert is going to comment and be like, it's Darrow! <laughs> Man, I've never seen anybody like Darrow uh, more than Albert. But anyway, guys, as always, information about my Patreon and Discord is down in the description, and I'll see you next time, guys.